all of you together because there's a lot of news we need to share that I think it's ideal that we have everybody moving together this morning. Originally, I had planned to just go over our major progress on the self of priorities. And I think what I'll let you do is read this out in the leisure. You can see that in the many areas that we set goals for ourselves this year, that all of our departments are making substantial progress. And if they haven't met their goals already, they will be met um, by the end of the year. Um, what I wanted to talk to you about this morning that I think is very timely is the proposal from the governor's budget related to special education funding because our window of opportunity to decide how we'll respond um, if the governor's final budget includes a lot of these um, proposals um, is going to be key that we know how we're going to move forward. So with that said, I'm expanding on what I had in the newsletter that I sent out the other day. So you can go ahead and look. So basically, in the newsletter I sent to you all after the last SELPA meeting, I had outlined what the governor's budget was, the LAO's recommendation, and then what the SELPA and coalition position. If you don't know, the coalition for adequate funding for special education is separate from the SELPA um, organization. We meet the Wednesday before our state SELPA meetings, school services, our lobbyists, and they are there to work with us in support. So let's start with number one. Local assistance funds. That's the federal funding that we get for special education, which is about 19 million in our budget. Um, because of sequestration, we know that there's going to be most likely a 5% cut, which would be like about a million dollars, if that all happens. But what the governor is proposing to do is to take the local assistance funding out of the 8602 calculation. The benefit to us, as we know, most all of our districts are declining in ADA, and so you know there's about $180 difference between the amount for growth and decline. If you're growing, you get about $464 per ADA, but if you're declining, they take away $645. And it's very complicated due to a bifurcated COLA, but if you take the federal funding out and make it separate, then the amount they take away, and remember we're all declining, goes down to about the same amount. They get a few dollars. That would be the advantage. The other, I want to share with you the whole scenario here. Right now, if the federal government doesn't fund us at what they're supposed to in a given year, then the state is supposed to backfill the state funding. But the state is benefiting, you can see there, to the tune of $85 million in decline it doesn't go anywhere that we know it's put back into the general fund. But we would much rather see that money go out to the districts to serve students with special ed needs. So we don't know what would happen right now to the backfilling with the federal funds, but that's not as much of an issue, and it's felt that it would be more advantageous to decrease that amount taken away from people. Regionalized services program specialists. This is supposed to be special education's opportunity to participate in local control, um, fiscal funding. And so um, what it would do is take the regionalized services and program specialist line items went right into the AB602 funding. So in essence, the line item for RS, which has always been there to support us <coughs> directly, to keep us funded with mutual money away from the district's problems process and everything else we do would get blended right into the funding formula. The other concern about that is when you blend money together, as you know, with all this high formal funding, when you blend all that together, now if funding goes down, which part was it? Was it the original 8602 or was it the RSTS? So we would be excited about So that's an area we're very concerned about. And also the next slide program in this cell, where we have historically provided a lot of program specialist support, that portion of the RSPS money has gone directly to the cell phone with our program specialists to support all of you. And so we're able to have a cadre of individuals that have very um, specialized skills that can work together as a team and provide support to all of the districts. So that would be another issue that we would have to discuss. No 
impact actually is advantageous to everybody. And that is that they take a couple of these little categorical staff development grants for the low incidence money. There's a little pot for low incidence equipment and one for services. So if you have to do these as interpreters at staff, then that would be low incidence services. Well, this would give you flexibility to choose if you were going to use the money that it's combined for low incidence equipment or services for your students that have low incidence disabilities. The staff development grants would just take the preschool grant, combine it with the one part B, the kids three to twenty two, and so that did not have an impact on it. Mental health. We know that throughout the state we're a little we're a little bit unique because you guys are way ahead of the curve. We already have the self providing mental health services when this all happened in October of 2010. But across the state, people are still stabilizing their mental health programs and don't know the exact cost. There's still a need for additional funding because we can't draw down the Medi-Cal funding, the full scope that county mental health could, which can offset the cost by up to 90%. So we don't know yet what the true cost of providing services across the state is, but we know it will be more than we anticipated. So as we're kind of having the county money go away, because even last year they got the 8,100 funds, and this is our first year of not having any other county funds available, we're still trying to see what it costs. So our thought, leave it separate for a little while still, so that the funding will most likely go up. Then at some point, roll it into the 8602 base, call it related services funding, gives you a lot more flexibility. Because even here this year, as I've visited different superintendents with their CEOs and program directors, the conversation has been, we don't know how to spend all this money. And so we know there's a need for the money, but we just don't want it to get blended yet. So I think it'd be our advantage to say. Workability. That one's one near and dear to my heart because I believe that workability is the best thing going we have, the best thing we have going for compliance for this transition indicator with the state and federal government. So the governor said, take the first 50 programs that had a federal tax code and the others that came later that have a state tax code, just give them one tax code. Everybody thought, no problem, that's a good thing. Well, the LAO, and we're thinking it's based on naivete or something, said no, collapse it in workability grant and change the workability grant to transition services and blow the money by NBA. Um, without going into all the details, because my plan is to go talk to each of the high school districts about this, um, I did a reference <coughs> the other day, and it looks like there's 6 million kids ADA in grades 9 through 12 across the state. And I don't have the exact numbers of our ADA, but my rough calculation was it would probably be about $6.33 per student, which if you calculate that by our ADA, would be like $1,000 budget down to about $300,000. So we're thinking, yeah, there are some inequities, but let's leave the workability program intact and work on the funding issue. Um, I am the co chair of the State Transition Committee at State SAPA. And Carol Gentile on our workability team is the state advisory chair. So we hopefully have an appointment to talk to the Department of Finance next week, provide them some information. Um, about four or five weeks now have come out in support of workability. And so we're taking those key documents of support and giving those to the LA office. So we're trying to do our part to keep it going. This one has some real potential for some money for you, finally. Um, there were some hearings at the um, legislature, well, within the legislators, and they came to a decision finally, I'm not exactly sure which committee, and they did decide that they would support and they voted to fund the mandate for the behavior um, intervention plan that we've been mandated to do, but there's been no money. A number of counties, about five counties, a number of years ago, filed a suit, and that's what has been resolved. So they're saying going back 19 years to 93, 94, up to 11, 12, that every district would get $9, a little over 45 cents per ADA in each of those years. 
as well as self-esteem as well as 18. Um, so we have to go back and do some reporting of what was our ADA in each of those years. The problem is there's no funding appropriated for this yet. So the catch-22 is we'll get instructions in July, and if we don't file by November, then we lose out. We cannot get the money when it's available. So it's to our advantage to do that. 12-13 is the first year they're going to start basing it on actual costs, and that gets kind of complicated. But we will be working with the back and pack to get all the details so that they can fall into their own class. So here's what I thought would be next steps, and please help me. Um, we all need to work on this together. So we need to decide what our position on each of these um, funding issues then um, we need to decide what action is going to be taken to support these positions as legislators and others. We probably need some work groups to study the impact here locally. And then based on the results of our study, we need to determine, of course, if the SELPA and the districts need to make some revisions to their votes. Any questions? Any comments? I really need some direction of how you would all do. Sorry. Thing. Um, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, I have, I'd like to submit to the superintendent's council um, from, a, from a, a fellow parent some tweaks to the procedural safeguards notice that, that he had written up. Um, and I'm just going to submit that. I'll just pass it forward. <laughs> I brought it with me. And then I have a newsletter. And I'm just going to pass that around um, that, that Educate Advocate had put together. On, on some various topics, uh, some that are very recent, and I hope you find it educational. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. We're going to move on into second C discussion yes. items. Uh, we have the yeah, just to
1B, which is called the estimated 10% special schools transfer. Um, this adjustment is being done in the revenue limit of the districts. And um, at the end of the year, we're going to look at it again. And if there's an adjustment needed to be done, we're going to do an adjustment again by September next year. In C1C, which is 1213 mid year, 50% facility costs, um, we're just transferring 50% of the, uh, the projected cost for this year. And at the end of the year, we're going to look at it again on how much we really, really end up spending there. And if there's an adjustment to this, we're going to go back and inform everybody again. For C1B, 1213 Provider Program MP facility cost transfer, this is a one-time transfer unless there's a change in contract in the classroom lease and maintenance agreements and also in the number of students per district. Any questions so far? Okay, I'll proceed to C1B. C1B. 1213 mid-year transportation cost to CSDR. This is the second payment, the second, actually it's not a 50% because there's always an adjustment every time we meet. Um, this is transporting the students to California School for the Deaf in Riverside. Um, the totals again will be adjusted at year end based on the actual cost that we incurred during the year. Let's proceed to C2. <coughs> Which is 1213 interim budgets update. Good morning. Um, I had attended the last Federal <coughs> Advisory Committee meeting combined with the Financial Advisors Committee meeting. And um, at that time, I raised the same issue that the budget is just very confusing. As you see on this budget, there's um, you know, items that are $1 million, $2 million that we're talking about, you know, transfers, and the description is a string of numbers. So as a member of the public, I have no, we have no clue what these large transfers are about, and that um, concerns me that we have such large amounts with no identifying information. Um, also, I had expressed at that meeting that um, Overall, the budget is just confusing, and actually some of the people had, in that meeting were already stating it was confusing to themselves. So that's concerning to me as a member of the public that the budget is presented in a way that's not only confusing to the public, it's confusing to those of you who need to understand it. And um, to my surprise, at that meeting, they actually decided to put together an ad hoc, ad hoc committee to address that. What really surprised me even more afterwards, though, was to find out at the last superintendent's council meeting, um, this had come up, and it was agreed upon to uh, look at a firm to help with this. And you know, I see that's on the agenda today. Eric Hall and Associates is a firm that's being um, retained to help with this issue. So it just surprised me that you know, we, uh, an ad hoc committee was formed after the fact that we'd already hired a firm so, I mean, is there just questions of communication, or is the right hand not knowing what the left hand is doing? And, you know, I just remain confused on that issue. Um, so, yeah, that's my, and this is on Z2? Yeah, okay, thank you. I guess my specific question would be, how do we know what these large transfers are about? I mean, and then as far as regards to helping with understanding the budget, um, you know, what happened with the ad hoc, ad hoc committee, and are we going with, you know, what's, what's, what's the next step there? So those are my two questions. Mr. Palmer, a few things. We have a fiscal allocation plan that's available to anybody that outlines it. Um, we will be talking about the spreadsheets. They're this close to getting done. And um, we have a workshop scheduled April 10th, I think, I'll get you the date. 
and it's going to be a workshop explaining our special education funding as well as the new spreadsheet. So we welcome you to join us. shows there's two spreadsheets there. So the next spreadsheet shows the actual second quarter that we have so far paid this community. So it includes the first quarter and the third second quarter plus. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to express that I, I shared in the concern for the request for an increase in funding. I believe it was 32 percent. What was what was being discussed at the PAC FAC meeting? Um, and I just share my concern. You know, a year ago, this was the company that we were saying wasn't really providing good services, and now they're asking for a 32 percent increase. And I think that this is uh, something that needs serious looking into. I'm, I'm assuming maybe that happened since the PAC FAC. But I just wanted to share in my, con my concern as a member of the public that this is uh, an egregious request, uh, considering that we've gone down 100 students that we're transporting and also the um, quality of their services. <coughs> November 16th, 
Um, we have taken the policy to the CAC, the package, and back asked for comments, asked for any suggestions for revisions. There were none. So as you would ask to take it through the process we're here today to give the superintendent the opportunity <coughs> to uh, make any comments about the disability policy. So do we have any uh, input? Um, at the um, November 16th meeting, there was a request that the Belgian room be um, tested for any possibility of mold. And as you can see in the um, documents showing the results of the um, testing, that there were not substantial amounts of mold in the process. Thank you. We have uh, under C8 is the uh, proposed Superintendent Council meeting dates. So if there are any concerns with those dates. is going to be changed. Okay, don't know to what they yet. This came to their attention as a conflict. Thank you. Uh, are there any others? Move forward with all of those and you'll get a revision on November 15th. Then move on to uh, area uh, section D, certain business consent items. <coughs> I have a motion to approve the consent agenda. Section E, Superintendent's Business Action Items. We have a uh, revision to the CAC bylaws. No discussion. All in favor? Any opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. We're going on to E2, the growth decline model approval and abstentions. Proposal. We have formed a 
with prior year 88, but when the SELPA distributes it to the district, the negative growth adjustment, since we're declining, of negative 644 per 88 is applied to only the declining districts. So among the 10 districts, some are growing, some are declining, but then this 644 88 in our current model is only applied to those that are declining. So the ones that are growing don't get anything. It's just zero. Distribution after negative adjustment is based on current year 88. So what happens, the impact of this is that the declining district gets less funding. As I said, growing districts do not get any growth adjustment <coughs> as alpha wise 88 is declining. So the impact of this, the growing districts do not receive anything. So our current, this is just to show you the, the current year distribution model. On, so this is the first column here, or this is the first column of numbers. It's for 12, 13, um, 88. It's, it's um, lower than prior year 88. But then the next one, which is a total of 77,000, that is the funding that we get. This is based on prior year 88. When we distribute it, as you see in, on the fifth column there, this one, it's only applied to the ones that are declining. So that's how our current model works. So in the end, the ones that are growing, like for example, a Claire, they don't get anything. 
it's just nothing is applied to them. And for instance, upland, because it's declining, negative growth applied to, to the district is 1,172,000. Uh, you know, the, the distribution, the amount of money they get is declined, is um, reduced by 1,172,000. Is there any question on this one? Okay. So here's what we're proposing, the, the committees are proposing. ABC Social 2 is still based on prior year ADA. There's no change. But in the distribution, instead of using the current year ADA, the work group work are proposing to use the projected future ADA of Instead of using the current year P2 ADA, to use the prior year ADA. So we're funded using prior year ADA, and we are proposing to use the distribution based on prior year ADA also. So it's at least you know, equal. And because of this, the negative growth adjustment will be applied to the ABC social base before distributing it. So meaning if we get the whole lump sum, we minus it off the top before distributing it to the districts, and the declining districts will have a, a little bit more when we distribute it using prior year ADA, and the growing districts will have a little bit less because it's more on making it everybody equal on a per um, per student. I'll show it to you. You can see here, actually I gave you this as a comparison, so it's important <coughs> to look at. So in the proposed distribution model, you can see that the S element for AD is equal to everybody, all the districts. So I gave you the summary, you have that in this back sheet here for you to review and also the summary for comparing the current and the proposed. So you can see there on the entitlement for ADA on the current is not equal to the district. But the entitlement for ADA on the proposed model is equal to per student for all the districts. So I'm, I put it all together for you guys to look you know, what will become of your I mean, from the current to the proposed model. Any questions? Yes. Yeah. Obviously, this is um, concerning to our district. It's about half a million dollars. Hang on just a bit. I'm point of order. We need a motion. We have a second. Second. Mr. Joseph. So now we can discuss. Thank you very much. I was just going to mention the state funds us on total ADA. That's why our model is based on total ADA. 
It's not it has nothing to do with special ed population or special ed ADA. It's a formal overall district ADA. But just, I knew you guys knew that because what I learned. But that doesn't mean you have to. Right, correct, correct. <coughs> Basically, what this proposal was, is because you have to distribute the money exactly the way it's current. Because we have been distributing it on current year, but when the self as a whole started declining, it's funded on the lesser, the greater of uh, prior years currently. So that's been causing a problem within the SEPA when you know we had the district who lost a charter and got hit twice because we were we were funded by the state on one year but distributed on a different. So they actually hit two years of that. So that that's what prompted us to look at a new model. So instead of saying we're funded on the prior year, the um, verbiage should actually be the funded ADA. Because if we were growing self up, we would be funded on current year ADA rather than prior year. I think that's part of the uh, request in recommendation is that uh, we consider which model and then which year we would implement or some combination thereof. Further, Sean? I, I have a question. Uh, I'm not sure I understood uh, what you shared. So are you saying this model is based upon for a district this year, our funding is based upon for the district, either last year's funding or this year's funding, whichever is greater, or it all goes back to last year's funding since we're last year's ADA is state funding. Well, how we're earning the money from the state is on the greater of prior year. And because the SEPA as a whole is declining, we are funded on the prior year of the, the SEPA as a whole. But once the money is received at the SEPA, the SEPA has been distributed on current year ADA rather than the way it was funded from the state. And so for those districts who were declining, they've been getting an additional hit for the decline, and the districts who were growing, and we had some districts that were growing, they weren't receiving any additional funding for their, for their growth. Because the stuff as a whole was taking a hit, and that hit was assigned to the districts that were declining a little. But under this model, the growth is not getting any either. Right. Okay. We, we looked at a couple, um, the two models that were the favorite in this group was distributing exactly the way the state funds, but still looking at the growth and decline, and getting the districts that were declining would get the negative, and districts that were growing the positive. That was one model. The second model was taking mm -hmm. the entire base of 8602 and the growth and income and putting it in one pot and distributing that whole pot, which is what's being presented here. That was the um, decision that worked with the three folders. And then that way. So, in one scenario, you sort of ride the whatever roller coaster you're on if you're, if you're increasing or decreasing in ADA, it would, it would affect you. And the other model, you sort of blended that across the whole SELPA. So, uh, it, it's less intrusive depending on your circumstances. But if you are growing sharply, this, that model probably is not going to help you much. If you're declining sharply, the model will probably help you. Yeah. I guess I'm doing analogy with this, this model has one big winner and a number of big losers. And I'm just going to talk to you guys with this. Um, I guess I just would hope that you could have looked at a model that maybe a little bit more accurate. Could I just this year, we have one big loser. Next year, we're going to have another big loser because we were just notified by the state yesterday that Chino has a charter that's been accepted, the Eldorado charter. So it's going to depend who's losing a charter and who's gaining a charter, but who is going to see that drastic decline that we wouldn't see otherwise when the great big charter decides to go to another shelter. Dr. Hammond? So, so we've <coughs> really done what Matt said. Well, then, Mike, is there consideration? Yeah, that's part of 
part of the recommendation in here, what, what I think we're being asked to do is select a model and year of implementation, okay. and or some combination. So as I've heard, uh, you know, have we looked at the, uh, the concept, perhaps, of a blended model over 12, 13, 14, so those that are losing uh, funding would be hit as hard as so we can blend it out that way. Um, and I've heard maybe we want to look at more closely at models one or two. Okay, and it's just my thing is to not have focus on the three happens for the shot. Okay, okay. You're suggesting that we select the 13, 14 year for the implementation. In our committee meetings, one of the things we talked about was possibly looking at this in 13, 14, but developing some sort of plan where there is a little more whole homeless, you know, that <coughs> kind of all interests were were discussed in terms of the loss. The hardest thing for us was the, the charters themselves, the gain and loss of the charter, because it's so sudden, particularly the loss, is, you know, I know that Upland is the, is the uh, player in this. Because over time, they grew from a charter of 150 to 1,400, I believe. And so, you know, they were growing all this time and they lose 1,400, you know, in one year. And our current model, it, it kind of exacerbated the fluctuations, whereas the proposed model makes it a little smoother and a little more transition time. Um, so that, that was the difficult dynamics, and I don't know if Upland wants to chime in on that. Very well. Thank you. And yes, I do want to thank you. Um, I know we're being seen as the one who is being a big gain out of this. And one of the things that I think that I've seen as we're looking at the equitability issue is when we did increase our enrollment, everybody in the group also was able to receive the benefits from that increase. When we decreased, we ended up taking a hit, which we were aware of, and we knew that that was going to happen. But the way the funding formula, we took not only the I think the only thing that this model does is give you a year to prepare for that loss. But if the charter was to leave the district, that drop, this proposal would give you a year to plan for that. Uh, and you would only you would only have to deal with it one time. Uh, in the current model, you get hit twice for the for the loss. But if the charter with students. 
sure what I need to do. I'm not serving those kids anymore. I mean, it's different than a decline in enrollment trend I see in my own students coming. I can do layoffs and prepare on these of those teachers. If I have a charter that leaves, I don't understand what I am what I'm planning for. If they're, because those kids are there, you're not serving them anymore, right? They're, they went somewhere else. And we did plan for that loss. And we took that loss. We knew that loss was going to be about $1.2 million. So we took that. The next year, the funding came. We took the loss again, but the money was still there and was distributed to the rest of the districts. Yes. I think one of the difficulties in the model that we have right now is that when the SELPA is growing and you are growing, you get double benefit because you get a bigger script share of the pie and you get growth dollars. And when you're declining, it's just the opposite. Well, sometimes you have something in the middle where the SELPA as a whole is declining, but you're growing. And so you do get a bigger slice of the pie, it's just a smaller pie. That's where the difficulty is. You've got two factors. It's how your district is growing and how the SELPA is growing. And you've got all kinds of variations on what might happen when you add 200 charter kids in your example. You might get funding for those growth kids and <coughs> stuff as a whole is growing. That's what makes it real tricky in our model. Right? So it really basically the economy of scale idea can sort of smooth out some of those rough edges. Any further comments? Questions? We also talked about giving money to like as many like next year if there's a pull up or whatever. But there were some of the numbers that thought that's money that should have gone to the districts already and now that money also is going to pay off the debt to the other districts. So we can consider that. But I just wanted you to know that we did look at other ways of kind of restoring Huffman in this case to make them pull using the Uh, is there a motion? What is your motion? Which model and which year of implementation? The current model and next year. So we have a motion to implement the model recommended, which is model number three, and to implement that in the 13, 14 years. Of second, second, second by Dr. Hamm. Any further comments, discussion? All in favor? Opposed? No. 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 Uh, Dr. Jensen, no. Uh, Matt Fulton, no. And no from Dr. Black. It's three. Any abstentions? I believe we have a, we have a majority. So model three has been adopted and will be implemented in the 13, 14,
and the West End Family Council and the Council for the Lilies will be moved to the council expenditures. And then we use the 1250-288 for distribution of the revenue. And then in the fee for service, there's a change that's being proposed by the group. Instead of using the assessed and the referred number of students on December 1 and April 1. Ms. Sanchez, are you moving on to E4? So let's stop and let's focus on E3, which is 1112. And basically, the recommendation here is that for fiscal year 2012, Spreadsheets that are provided in this <coughs> Do I hear a motion? Good. Where's the second? Who is that? Any discussion from the comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Extensions? Motion carries. Now let's go on to E4 for 12 to
allocation, I gave these numbers to you, all of you. So for 11 and 12, the balance to receive. This is just the balance that you have to receive in 11 and 12. This is not the total allocation. Because the rest of the balance you already received in prior years. I don't want to count that as the amount you will receive this year. So the 11 12 balance you receive and then the 12 15 allocation for your budget purposes, you can base it on this amount. And I think I need separate sheets to show you that for your budgets. Any questions? Okay, uh, we have we have a motion. Uh, on the educationally rated mental health services funding allocation, and uh, there's five points I would direct your attention to at the bottom of E4 that have to do with administrative residential clinical parent training program, parent project, and parent residential visitation reimbursement expenditures be taken off the top. The allocation be distributed among districts using the P2 ADA ratio. Counseling fee for service be calculated using December 1 and April 1 student counts as a denominator and total cost of self counseling program expenditures at the base. self payments to the West End Family Counseling and any other outside agencies rendering counseling services to the West End students will be reimbursed by the districts based on a first student served. And the final allocation amount will be distributed to districts as state funding is received by SELPA. Do we have a motion? Second. By Sherry Black. Okay, comments, questions? And then on number four, shouldn't that be on actual cost per student? It says, well, um, the West End students that the district would be paying on a per student cost to actually the actual cost yes. for that student. Yes. Yeah, we based it on the invoices that we pay with uh, agencies, so that's where we're leaving off. But for 1213, it's a projection based on the actual cost that we have so far. Okay, and uh, okay. we have an amendment to the motion with that language, actual cost for student. And on the second, is the second willing to amend? Any further questions? Yes. Um, the counseling budget, who approved that budget? Does the committee approve the counseling budget? The committees have seen it and we have shown how much where it is taken from. We have shown all the links of the FTE and all the position numbers that's there. But is that something that gets approved by the committee Jeanette, or it's just presented? It's approved by the superintendent's council when we renew our 13-14 budget and do a portion of that. The 12-13 is coming for 1.9 to 2.5. That was the projected budget that was approved last spring. Okay. Yeah. But as Jeanette explained, there are some vacancies in there that we filled with contracted individuals this year because they were already with us and we continued them. So the cost was going to drop. <coughs> okay. We just included in the next meeting because this is this program is new and it wasn't in the list based on last year, but we could add that in the program update. So you're looking for a, a, a projected versus actual? Um, no. Question, Jeff? Can I get clarification on something just so it's That's okay. <laughs> just so the minutes reflect it. Um, when it talks about off the top and all residential administrative expenditures, it, it doesn't address the um, South Coast Wraparound Program. And But down in number four, when it talks about West End Family Counseling and all other outside agencies, I mean, that can be interpreted as South Coast as well. And so for future reference and minutes, if it isn't clarified what South Coast is as opposed to West End Family, it could end up being a 
For clarification, typically students that are in residential placements have a step down before they come back to your district and they receive the services from South Coast. Those have been historically considered residential services, and so that's why they were in the opt-in talk portion. Do you want that recorded exactly in the district? Uh, just so I said later on, we'll refer, refer back to this because it is an outside contract. That you know, made from this stuff, and because number four states and other outside agencies. Thank you, <coughs> Dr. Johnson. I just have a question on note number five. What did you model? Okay. Pay for service rate is different on the spreadsheet, so should it be the spreadsheet amount? Or should the note say sixty to seventy? Yes. And there's also in the formula that I put there, it should be just the surveys for 12-13. We don't, we don't count very much. The numbers go in the budgets is correct. It's just the note there that won't change. Okay. I have a question about wraparound services. When, before those are offered to a student, if the current cell phone counselors don't have a full caseload, do they provide wraparound service before it goes out to the agency or is it automatic? Thank you for your question. We have one uh, sub counselor who is designated to do residential services, and actually her salary comes off the top and not in the other one that are um, paid by the district. And so she has been trying to save and doing some wrap services herself because wrap services, and this is one area I want to explore more deeply next year, of course, wrap services are just a blanket 5000 per month. And so we think that we can provide a lot for five dollars a month. Thank you. Other questions? All right, we have a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Extensions? Motion will carry. We move on to E5. Uh, program transfer approval. You have in your packet the handout that delineates which districts have requested to transfer programs for next year. Um, just wanted to clarify a few things before we move forward with the official um, program transfer. The districts have done their due diligence to follow all the procedures that they have to, but we have uh, um, policy and procedure that are not aligned with each other. Under Ed Code, the program transfer um, policy in our local plan is per Ed Code, and it says that um, the day on which transfer programs will take effect may be no earlier than the first day of the second fiscal year beginning after the date on which the sending or receiving agency has informed the other agency and the superintendent's council, unless the superintendent's council unanimously approves the transfer takes effect on the first day of the first year. So I just wanted to make sure, because our policy says this would not happen until 14, 15, that we do make a motion today that covers that aspect of it if we do approve all of the program transfers. Um, the program transfers are mostly um, transfer of county programs. Um, with two of the districts requesting to um, transfer the um, responsibility of counseling services to the district. Okay, we have a motion on E5, program transfer approval. Moved by Dr. Judson, second by Wisdom. Any further comments or questions? So as I understand this, we need a unanimous approval for this to move forward for next year. Uh, all in favor of the motion? transfers to occur in next year.
move on to E6. This is transportation excess cost. And we have Ralph Alba. We have a presentation for the Superintendent's Council. <coughs> decided that before the next finance advisory committee that we go ahead and uh, have a small group of people come and meet myself and my staff at the support center in San Bernardino. Some items that were reviewed were um, number of buses utilized, student counts, number of aides, bus routing, home to school proximity, fence liquidations, time monitor, three hour bus interval rates, field and special trips, school calendars, bell schedules, transportation contracts, salaries and benefits, supplies, expenditures, and whatnot. After the group met, the group uh, understood that although student counts may go down, it doesn't necessarily mean overall expenses go down, particularly with the home to school transportation with the contract we have for students. Um, we came up with some um, possible cost-cutting measures moving on to the next academic year, 2013-14 which we will share at the next uh, program and finance advisory committee, which I don't know when that is, but we will discuss that. In any event, um, we talked about our challenges in transporting the special needs children, uh, limitations as far as how long we want them on the bus, uh, limitations as far as how many students are allowed on the bus, and um, I went back and tried to sharpen my pencil just a little bit more for the uh, mid-year revision. <clears throat> for the 2012-13 January mid-year, based on estimated student counts of 533.75 students, small reduction in salaries um, based on what was uh, presented in October, 215,990 benefits, 90,735 supplies, 850 services, 4,905,043. Um, home to school transportation is included within the services. Uh, any direct cost of $24,559. <clears throat> the amount of state revenue that's been allocated based on the student counts within the West End SELPA is $1,520,551.82. Given a total excess cost of $3,716,625.18. That cost is distributed calculated based on the amount of students in each and every district, and that's each district has a full cost. Thank you, Mr. Alba. We need a motion to approve the excess cost transportation. then we will move on to uh, number seven, superintendent council vice chairperson with the uh, loss of Gary Rutherford, we will need to select another vice chairperson so that we have a motion. Any further nominations? 
Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Let's hope that uh, all of stay on the job. <laughs> We're going to move on then to F of council member reports. Any council members have reports? I would just like to uh, thank the staff, uh, great presentations today, and uh, thank uh, Susan for this wonderful summary of the efforts being made by West and Selvas, uh, great progress being made. Any future agenda items? Thank you.